Come now, vast God, to this high occasion, to this Nobel conference that praises its scholars, anoints its students, and crowns its honored guests. We praise you for the courage of lonely explorers into the realms of fact, and for the collegial fellowship which advances all scientific discovery. Save those whose life is spent in research from irresponsibility for the end products of their work and make them sensitive to the whole meaning of what they do. Forbid that our cleverness should thrust us toward disaster or our earnest experiments deliver humankind to unforeseen tragedy. Seeing our work as our calling, may we make it serve the vast intention of your love. Amen. On behalf of the faculty and staff of Gustavus Adolphus College, it's my pleasure once again to welcome you to the Nobel Conference. This is Nobel 20. We are pleased that so many of you could join us today. I know that some are still looking for seats, and I think you will find them by coming up the side aisles or uh, looking in the balcony. I know it's easier for me to see them for, than for you to see them, but there are still uh, seats available. Our reservations for tickets indicate that we have with us today about 4,000 uh, guests on campus. You come to us from a number of places. You represent nearly 160 high schools in our area. You represent 75 colleges and universities, and uh, we have registrations for this conference from 12 states in the Midwest area. We meet today, as we have in past years, in what we have come to know here at Gustavus as Lund Arena. Lund Arena is part of a larger complex which is just now being completed and it will be dedicated on the 21st of October. We will name it the Lund Center. We invite you to look around this facility as time permits. You will find some areas locked or blocked off as construction uh, continues in preparation for the dedication, but you are welcome to uh, visit uh, any of the areas uh, that are open. Events like this, of course, do not just happen by some spontaneous process. They are the result of a great deal of work and thought by many people. I can't begin to recognize the literally hundreds of people who contribute to the success of the Nobel Conference year after year, but I want to identify just a few. In a little bit, you will hear from Professor Mike Shafto, who has chaired the committee for Nobel 20. We thank Professor Shafto and his committee. A special acknowledgment to Chaplain Richard Elvey, who brought us the invocation and who is the program director for the Nobel Conference. Special recognition is also due to those who work in the area of public events at Gustavus, Elaine Brostrom, Dennis Paschke, and all of their staffs. Dozens of other people in the food service and the grounds crew, members of the faculty, all have participated. And of course, we want to express our very special appreciation to the Lund family. And I know 
Patricia is here. I think I saw her walk in just a bit ago. Patricia, to you and the other members of your family, the Lund family, who have so generously provided for this conference and all the other things that you have done for this college. I hope that you received a program as you came in, a program with uh, this face on it, which should be familiar to you by the end of the conference. You'll see it in many places. Uh, there are lots of events and lots of activities listed in that program which go beyond the, the lectures themselves. These include the concert this evening in Christ Chapel, the art show in the art gallery, the firing line programs which will be conducted this evening at 8.30, and other events as well. We, we invite you as guests to look around the facilities, particularly Bernadotte Library, which is just to the south of, of this complex. You are invited to stop in there, as time permits, in Nobel Hall and other places. I would like to just identify the members of our panel this year uh, at this time. Uh, I am going to uh, ask them to stand. I will simply introduce them by name at the end of that time. Uh, we can greet them with a round of applause. Uh, they will be uh, introduced more fully as their opportunity comes to uh, present their lectures. But at this time, I would like to introduce our six uh, guests. Uh, Daniel Dennett, Gerald Edelman, Brenda Milner, Arthur Peacock, Roger Schenk, and Herbert Simon. Thank you for being with us. We have come together these days to give attention to some of the issues related to human cognition and also to consider the ways in which our cognitive processes may relate to machines, especially to the computer. We will be discussing these topics during the next two days. And uh, I am now going to make uh, what will be probably my total contribution to the thought on this uh, important topic. As I share with you an anecdote that I heard just a few days ago, uh, one of the issues that uh, is of great interest to a number of people has to do with, with the language capability of man and how this may relate to uh, computer uh, simulation and the like. Story goes that a young man, uh, very interested in language and in computers, developed a program which he believed would translate English into Russian. He brought it to one of the major software companies and presented it to them. They were interested. They said, we will try it out. Our test here is to translate from English to Russian, and then we translate back from Russian to English to see if we have the same statement that we started with. They took as their test phrase the old adage, the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak. They put it into the computer. It was translated into Russian. It was then translated back to English. And they read the following output. The wine is all right, but the meat is undercooked. <laughs> I don't know, Mike Shafter, what you can do with that, but I'm sure you can do something to recover uh, the integrity of this uh, conference as I call upon Professor Mike Shafto, the uh, professor of psychology at Gustavus and currently with the Office of Naval Research in Washington, who has uh, directed the committee who brought this conference together, Professor Shafto.
welcome to the 20th Annual Nobel Conference, How We Know the Inner Frontiers of Cognitive Science. I have just one special announcement to make. We have some excellent displays of educational technology and artificial intelligence that will be open to the public today and tomorrow. These displays are in Alumni Hall upstairs in the old Student Union Building. If you don't know where that is, it will be worth the effort to ask someone. I invite you to go up and look at these displays at your leisure anytime today or tomorrow. I want to, at this time, express my thanks to Richard Fuller of the Physics Department and Mark Kruger of the Psychology Department, as well as to Mr. Arnold Ryden from the Gustavus Board of Trustees for their initiative in bringing these displays to campus for Nobel. Now, I'll turn the microphone over to my longtime friend and colleague and great recruiter of talented students into the neurosciences, Tim Robinson, who will introduce our first speaker. It's a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Gerald Edelman. Since the details of Dr. Edelman's existence are documented quite well in the conference program, I restrict my remarks to a brief description of his work as a researcher and theoretician. Dr. Edelman did his undergraduate work at Ursinus College in Pennsylvania and later obtained a degree in medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. After practicing medicine just briefly in the United States Army, he returned to graduate studies at Rockefeller University, where he worked in the laboratory of Henry Kunkel. In 1960, he received the PhD degree and set up his own laboratory at Rockefeller, where he's worked ever since. Now, these were exciting times for molecular biologists. The structure of the DNA molecule had just been discovered only a few years before, and researchers were just be beginning to realize that knowledge of the chemical structure of significant biological substances was indeed possible. Dr. Edelman sought to understand the chemical structure of the immunoglobulin molecule. He began with the assumption that this giant molecule, like many others, is composed of two or more chain structures held together by crosslinks. By developing a procedure which allowed him to sever these crosslinks, he was able to show that the antibody molecule was indeed composed of one pair of light chains and another pair of heavy chains. He and Rodney Porter of Oxford University were awarded the Nobel Prize for this discovery in 1972. It's interesting to note that Dr. Edelman is the only person that I know who was awarded the Nobel Prize for his doctoral dissertation. He also received this award at the relatively tender age of 43. Uh, in the Nobel Prize citation, he and Porter were credited with having introduced the critical procedures which opened the gates to broader understanding of the molecular basis of the immune system. Now, at this point, some of you may be wondering how it is that a Nobel Prize winning molecular biologist working in the field of immunology came to be invited to address a conference dealing with the topic of learning. Well, as it turns out, Dr. Edelman has been interested in the workings of the brain for many years. He hinted at this interest when he, along with 22 other Nobel Prize laureates, attended the 1975 Nobel Conference entitled The Future of Science. One of the keynote speakers that year was the veteran brain researcher Sir John Eccles, who described the, last, the, the attempt to discover the working of the human brain as one of the last remaining frontiers of science. In summarizing his many years of research on the topic, he finally concluded by saying that in order to understand some functions of the human brain, that it was actually necessary to posit the existence of a metaphysical force. Needless to say, this using a so-called ghost in the machine to explain higher brain functions surprised many of his fellow Nobel laureates. One of the most interesting responses to this talk came from Dr. Edelman. 
who presented an analogy from the field of immunology. He pointed out that in many respects, the immune system could be mistaken for a cognitive or thinking system, since it seems to possess a memory and has the ability to recognize foreign bodies, but that in fact, it works according to the principle of selection and that its apparent complexity was perfectly explicable in terms of normal evolutionary processes. He concluded by suggesting that this principle of selection may possibly be operating in the brain as well. Two years later, a small book written by Dr. Edelman in collaboration with Vernon Mountcastle called The Mindful Brain appeared, in which he clearly described his vision of the brain as what he terms a selective machine. Right. This vision of the brain as an organ of almost immeasurable complexity, which nonetheless operates according to the principles which have developed over the course of our evolutionary history, will be the subject of his talk today. Let's welcome Dr. Gerald Edelman. Thank you, Dr. Robinson. President Kendall, Reverend Elvey, Professor Shafto, colleagues, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It is a particularly happy occasion for me to return to Gustavus Adolphus, and I remember the occasion alluded to with great pleasure. And it's a particular pleasure indeed to have the opportunity to talk amongst these distinguished colleagues about a very interesting subject. Indeed, my remarks shall be about the greatest inner frontier of present-day science, the nature of the human brain. What I want to do is to convey to you some of the excitement those of us privileged to work in this field feel about it. But I should hasten to say that this is not going to be a scientific lecture. And indeed, it cannot be, given the pressures of the occasion, the complexity of the subject, the vastness of the audience, the smallness of the speaker. Um, I think we have to enter into some convenient arrangements together, a kind of pact. And rather than detailing the legal terms of this pact, what I would like to do is um, exemplify what I have in mind by telling you a story of two Jewish tourists from New York who went to Israel for the first time and on their first night of their sojourn decided they would go to a nightclub in Tel Aviv. And um, they heard a stand-up comedian telling one-liners in Hebrew. And one of the tourists fell off the chair laughing. The other looked down and he said, what are you laughing at? You don't even understand Hebrew. And he looked up and he said, I trust these people. <clears throat> Here is what I hope to do. What I'd like to do first is to illustrate the difference between what I shall call the physical order, that which scientists describe, and what we might call the sensory order, that necessary but not sufficient step that scientists need in order to interact with the world. Then, because it's particularly germane to some of my latter remarks, I want to talk a bit about what is called in biology population thinking and to contrast it briefly with previous modes of thinking uh, and previous views of biology and of our nature. And then what I'd like to do is discuss two views of the brain that I shall for brevity call the information processing model and certainly the most prevalent model, I think, in both neuroscience and in cognitive science today. And then what I'd like to do is discuss the rather new population model and consider some of the evidence that tends to support it. And finally, if time permits, what I would like to do, uh, having been enjoined by the organizers of this symposium uh, to speculate or extend my remarks into domains of, in which I'm not particularly expert, I'd like to see what the consequences of the assumption that the population model is correct might be. And of course, that is what makes this not a scientific lecture. If it were a scientific lecture, I would in fact search for ways of showing that the model is incorrect. And so um, that is my program. 
and I hope you'll bear with me because it has many complex parts. But I have the privilege of being followed by both eloquent and informed colleagues. You're going to hear from my fellow speakers about a variety of most extraordinary psychological subjects. Information, learning, memory, intentions, and intentionality. What I'd like to do today, and perhaps it is not amiss since it is prior to all of these subjects in some sense, is to consider a subject closer to the immediate confrontation of the brain and the environment. Namely, that way or the principles in which the brain is organized to carry out perception, the awareness of things that are present to sense. And the kinds of questions I want to consider are, how are sensory discriminations made? How, in fact, is past sensory experience represented in the brain? And how does generalization occur upon a meager sensory experience? Well, many of the things you're going to hear about by subsequent speakers will probably take perception for granted. But it is not a trivial subject, I hope, to persuade you. Indeed, is it in many ways a much more challenging problem than the problem of learning itself, hard as that is. I also perhaps ought to emphasize right at the outset that it's entirely feasible to do much of psychology without any concern whatsoever for brain mechanisms. But ultimately, if we're to avoid error, we must confront the thorny problem of how the brain works. Otherwise, I'm afraid, we're going to be lost in refinements of language, but not necessarily in refinements of perceived facts. So, um, I, I don't see a pointer here, and I, if, if in lieu of a pointer I wave my hands around, you'll get the idea. To illustrate that possible risk, I might have the first slide. I see, I see nobody on the road, said Alice. I only wish I had such eyes, the king remarked in a fretful tone, to be able to see nobody and at that distance too. That, in fact, prefigures the predicament that some of us have when we try to consider the matters of sensory awareness and perception. To turn seriously for a moment to the first problem, namely the difference between the physical order and the sensory order, let me begin by pointing out the difference uh, in an example between the world described by science and the world of perception, which requires uh, uh, looking at objects but is not necessarily veridical and depends enormously upon the context in which they are perceived. May I have the next slide, please? <clears throat> Well, if you uh, were asked whether the lines in these figures were parallel, I think most of you would agree that the lines that are in the top figure of this so-called Wundt herring illusion uh, were curved inwards, and uh, that the lines below were curved outwards. And if I asked you, well, how would you be absolutely sure about that, the scientifically minded amongst you, would probably measure the, in, the distance at right angles between the two lines and come up with the fact that, in fact, the lines are parallel. This uh, is a rather trivial, but I think telling example of the problem we face in confronting the sensory order. Everything that we see is not everything that is the case, and yet we need uh, that information in order to construct a valid scientific description. I wanted to start with this example because I think it's extremely important to understand that what is common sense is not necessarily the way in which the sensory order works, and indeed there are probably very good evolutionary reasons for this. But my main concern here is not with that subject of which this is a part known as psychophysics. Um, instead, it is to try to develop a view of the brain in terms of its organization and to confront how, in fact, we can perceive such objects, and particularly how, upon presentation of a few examples of them, we can generalize to a very large number of cases. 
Of course, that will take for granted that there are elements of learning in the system. Perhaps in order to provide a basis for my further remarks, I should deviate at this point and tell you a little bit about um, population thinking, because it will be necessary to our argument, and I'm not sure all of you um, are familiar with that. That is the great development um, for which, may I have the next slide? Darwin and his colleague across the seas, Wallace, was familiar, and here is Darwin in his lugubrious latter years. Um, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, the central theory of biology founded by Darwin and Wallace over a hundred years ago, and I think most people would admit ideologically the most significant scientific theory ever constructed. Before Darwin, thinking about the origin of biological order was under the sway of an idea that has been various co variously called the great chain of being, the scalum naturae, or for short, essentialism. Since Plato, nature was assumed to consist of classes or taxa defined by properties from the top down, fixed and in plenitude. And in this view, individual variation was a noisy inconvenience to be ignored, or it was assumed to be a symptom of the fallibility of our earthly life. And in any case, the origin of the species was assumed by definition. Darwin's great contribution in creating population thinking was to understand that individuality was of the essence, that variance in a population was real and not just noise, indeed the basis for change, and that it was this basis upon which natural selection acted through the environment to select those individuals who, whose adaptations were on the average greater, thus leading to their differential reproduction. And just for my colleague up the booth, I'm going to switch down here. You might take the slide off. Thank you. If I might have the lights for a moment. <clears throat> Clearly, this is a course grade intelligence test for speakers. Here on this first uh, transparency, I've tried to illustrate to you the basic idea of population thinking, uh, refurbished, of course, in modern terms. Um, the origin of the variation within a population is mutations in genes in the genetic material. And eventually, through a most complex process, this leads to a functioning animal form, but with variation, constituting over a whole group of consorting animals a species or a population. Natural selection will then, in fact, pick certain individuals, the ones that are uncrossed, for differential reproduction. It does not mean survival of the fittest. It means average survival of the most adapted over some period of time. And this is the basic notion of population thinking, I dare say, the central idea in biology. What can we conclude from this? Um, what we can conclude is that um, all of Darwin's presuppositions, except for his genetics, were correct. Variation within the population is not informed as to outcome. It is by chance. The environment is remorselessly independent. And on the average, the most adapted will survive. It is um, not a pleasant thought for certain benefactors of modern science that the less fit must eventually die. Um, these are the basic premises of the theory of natural selection. 
Now, I want to turn from the consideration of this global, indeed, all-encompassing theory of biology to a very specific example, the immune system, to indicate to you that while the evolutionary system works over aeons of time, over large numbers of years, selective systems can operate in somatic time, that is, within an organism and during its lifetime. And the best founded modern, modern example we have of that is a field, as you've heard, that I used to be in called immunology. And uh, the basic point I wish to make is that the prevalent theory in that field uh, was quite different 20 years ago than the theory that is, in fact, I think everybody will agree, proven today. Let me say a bit about what the immune system does. The immune system is a system in your body represented by molecules and cells in your blood capable of telling the difference between self and not self at the molecular level. It is clearly a non-cognitive system, despite the attempts of certain Russian biologists to prove that it is uh, fundamental, fundamentally influenced by the brain. But it is a, a system of exquisite specificity. Uh, to give you a feeling for that specificity, the immune system can recognize the difference in two huge protein molecules of one carbon chain just tilted a few angles away, and tell it from all other things in a positively naming sense. Now, how can that be? Um, given all the different compounds that organic chemists can construct that certainly never existed before in the evolution of the species, how can it be that your body can positively distinguish self from not self in this discriminatory fashion? The theory that prevailed before uh, so much modern knowledge accumulated uh, had as its greatest proponent Linus Pauling, and it was the theory of instruction in the immune system. And it assumed that the foreign molecule shown here by a little benzene ring, this ring here with some nitro groups sticking on it, the foreign molecule transferred information about its structure to a cavity in the antibody molecule, the recognizing molecule, and then removed itself, much as you might make a cookie with a cookie cutter, if you will, to give the reciprocal image. And that that uh, folded crevice was in fact the informed recognizing site, which would then uh, recognize all further instances of this molecule. You can see why it's called the theory of instruction. Information was transferred about three-dimensional structure from the molecule to be recognized to that which would recognize it. Now, um, that theory has been displaced. This is not the occasion for me to say why and how. Instead, what I'd like to do is tell you about the theory that now prevails. Of course, all theories in science are pro tem, but the evidence is overwhelming that in principle this theory of selection is correct. And the idea is quite uncommonsensical. It says that prior to confrontation with any foreign molecule, your body has the capability of making a huge repertoire of different antibody molecules with different shapes at their binding sites, a priori. And then, when the foreign molecule shown by this little benzene ring here comes in, it pulls that repertoire, and when it finds a shape that fits more or less well, it amplifies that recognition by stimulating those particular cells, for example, number two, number five, and number seven, to divide and reproduce. They reproduce to form the asexual progeny of a single cell, which is known as a clone. And therefore, the theory which is first formulated by McFarlane Burnett is called clonal selection. Now, you can see very interesting properties of this system. In the first place, there's more than one way, given the a priori nature of the system, of recognizing a particular thing above any criterial threshold. The second thing you notice about it is it has the potential for memory. Consider, for example, that this particular group of cells stops here in this branch and the rest go on to some end, producing antibodies of a kind that would recognize the original antigen. But now I have very many more of the original stem cells because they've divided. That can constitute for the lifetime and over life, overlapping lifetimes of different recognition cells a memory, and indeed is a crude description of what is now known as immunological memory. 
a memory so staggering that if you're exposed to yellow fever, for example, you will still be immune to it at age 80 if you were exposed at age 10. Well, the main thing about this that I want to convey is that the theory of instruction turned out to be wrong that in the biological example of a non-cognitive recognizing system with exquisite specificity, it turned out that the principle was one of somatic selection upon a huge set of variant cells, which of course had fiddled their DNA, their gene, gene material, in such a way as to make different kinds of, of locks, if you will, that are going to receive the keys of foreign molecules. And in ignorance of what they were to confront, now, perfectly clearly, you see the consequence of that assumption, that the fit is not perfect, but nonetheless, the system, by a series of elaborate feedbacks, can accomplish as exquisite a recognition as you please. And so we come to this position, that in evolution, essentialism turns out to be wrong. Taxonomic classes, as Darwin so beautifully pointed out, are defined from the bottom up through selection upon variance. That is an over-evolutionary time. In immunity, in backboned animals, instruction is wrong. It turns out that the selection is from a repertoire of specialized cells that make huge numbers of variants. Indeed, you can have as many as 10 to the 11th of these cells, um, uh, different kinds, and uh, countless trillions of possibilities for these a priori antibody combining sites. And now the question before us is this. In its fundamental operations, not at the level of information processing and language, in its fundamental operations, closer to the evolution of cells and cell groups themselves, is it the fact that the brain is constituted according to a theory uh, that could be described by a theory of instruction in information processes, or does the brain operate by selection? Now, in order to uh, get at this problem, I have to deviate again. But let me summarize what I've said so far. What I've said so far is in two major examples in which an extraordinary adaptation takes place, so refined in both cases that the initial impression was one of instruction, it has turned out that instruction and typological thinking and essentialism is incorrect. The second thing I want to point out is that both selective systems are similar, but you must not make the mistake that their mechanisms are the same. The things they have in common is that you must have a very wide repertoire of variants a priori. You must have some effective possibility of scanning those variants, and then you must have a very high gain amplification of the selected examples that happen to fit. And the consequence in a finite population is that some of the others must be suppressed or die. Well, Let's take this up with respect to the brain, but before I do that, I have to say a little bit about the brain. Dr. Milner will speak in much more sophisticated terms. Uh, given, my, uh, um, given my project, I would like to go over some elemental features, and you will hear from her about the elegant studies that have been done relating the structure of the brain to that fundamental process of memory. Right now, what I want to point out is the for your memory itself of this subject, that the brain really is composed of globs and slabs. These globs and slabs are connected to sense receptors, my eyes, ears, etc. Um, in my case, in my eyes, not recommendable. Um, in, and, and in muscles, which must not be underestimated. In fact, they very commonly are. And I want to say something about the order of this brain, but not get into much tedious detail. The great problem, of course, is much of the assumption that psychology can proceed without a description of this kind can lead to asking one question too many. The story is of the doctor who is accused of malpractice and of dispatching a patient, and the brain of the alleged decedent is put in a jar as exhibit A. And the zealous lawyer for the defense of this hapless doctor is questioning another doctor on the stand. And he said, now, Dr. Brown, did you see the alleged decedent, Mr. Smith, in your practice? And he said, no, sir. He said, well, did you carry out a post-mortem, or were you present at a necropsy? No, sir. Your Honor, he said, I declare a mistrial. I want you to declare a mistrial. There is not even any evidence that the alleged decedent is alive or dead. And the doctor looked at the lawyer, and he said, I cannot assert whether he is alive or dead. All I can say is that that is his brain in the jar over there. For all I know, he might be out practicing law someplace. 
Before I turn to some concrete examples of how the brain is constituted microscopically of cells, a, a most astonishing subject, insofar as, for example, in the cerebral cortex alone, this, the organ of which you shall hear from Dr. Mil Milner, in the size of a very generous table napkin, you have 10 billion neurons with 1 million billion connections. If you count one per second, you'll finish 32 million years later. These neurons, or cells, are connected in a very peculiar arrangement. They have processes and connect process to cell body, process to cell body, in a structure first named by the great physiologist Sherrington, the synapse. And we now know at that synapse, as a result of electrical activity in the neuron, a chemical transmitter of a varied kind is released, stimulating the next cell and so on down the chain. So we have an electrochemical interaction going across a structure. Now the point is, what is the structure? The temptation is to assume that the structure is a very orderly thing, as indeed any neurologist who makes a diagnosis will tell you it is. But I assure you, the evidence to the contrary notwithstanding, it is not a Heathkit. I want to show you the counterexamples of variance in the nervous system. Now, it's a very important thing to understand in selective theories that you can't talk about variance until you talk about remembered commonality or common structure. That, of course, is clear in evolution. If it's all mutation, it can't be any selection. If it's all selection and no mutation, the system can't go on either. And so I have to show you some examples, which I hope my colleagues who are more neurologically adept than I will not take amiss. They are not to say that the nervous system is not highly ordered in the sense that your faces are highly ordered. It is to say, in addition, it is highly variant. And so I would like to show you some slides of that. And here, no, I guess that isn't going to work. Maybe, uh, could I have the next slide, please? Here is a picture of the brain of an owl monkey. It looks extraordinarily faded. I see why. The course grade intelligence test. <laughs> there. This is a picture, a cartoon, if you will, of the brain of an owl monkey. And what I want to point out to you is that, not as corrugated as ours, fortunately, for researchers, that this structure is organized into zones or regions, which have been well known. And I don't want to go into the tedium of that, just to point out that I'm going to discuss one of them a little later on. Uh, for example, that one up there called 3B and that one over here called 1, those intricate maps that you see over there. In different owl monkeys, you'll see by using an electrode to uh, look for this electrical activity of which I spoke and stimulating a hand, for example, that it is mapped in a curious way, finger by finger and zone by zone. I'm going to talk about that. And other portions of the cortex are mapped to deal with the recept primary receptors for vision, for hearing, and what have you. And there are indeed, as you will hear, much more elaborate centers. So um, I want to introduce you to the idea that it is not just a plethora of neurons, but there's, there is, in fact, an organization in terms of mapping the world, the three- or four-dimensional world, through a two-dimensional sheet onto this cortex. On the next slide, you will see some examples of the variants. If I were to zoom down and look by cutting through this cortex at the kinds of cells you will see, the first thing I will notice is there are at least six layers. And in these layers, starting from the top, that is the outside surface going down towards the center of the brain, I will see an extraordinary host of so-called neurons, nerve cells, of different shapes, connectivities, and chemical responses. So there's an enormous variety of types of neurons, a matter of some controversy, in fact. Some people are lumpers and say there are really only two types, excitatory and inhibitory. Others, like the great Ramani Kahal, who first described these things uh, in detail, would argue that there were really extraordinary numbers, at least 30 or 40 different types, and perhaps even more, in terms of just sheer morphology. The second point I want to make is that there are not only types. Could I have the next slide? but that amongst one particular type of nerve cell, could I have the next one? There is an extraordinary variance. 
never mind the details, but this happens to be the so-called contralateral descending movement detector of the locust. It is a neuron, this one descending here. Um, it's a neuron which is going to do something to an extensor muscle just before the locust takes a flight and brings on a plague of locusts. And uh, uh, if you look at four different locusts, you will see an extraordinary variance. In fact, amongst 80% of a randomly chosen pop population, despite the fact that their behaviors are more or less alike, you will see this kind of variance in the neuroanatomy. Well, you might argue they're not genetically inbred. They differ in their genetic instructions. And so we go to a little organism, the water flea, or Daphnia, which is parthenogenetic and female, thank God. It takes on the burden. There's no male chauvinism there. Um, and if you look at certain visual neurons or cells in Daphnia, you will see that the left and the right side are not alike. And if you pick four examples of genetically inbred and identical animals, you will see they are not alike, as you can see in this picture. And finally, to respect the great Ramani Kahal, here is a picture of the cerebellum of the rabbit from his great classic. And you can see even in repetitive nervous structures, there's an extraordinary amount of diversity. Well, so much for that. So what I've said is that the brain, could I have the lights? The brain is composed of uh, countless millions of these neurons in many types. Perhaps you could put on the next slide and then give me the lights. And that the, the final point is that besides varying in type and besides having variants within type, this is the so-called terminal arbor of one of the neurons, it's an actual picture or tracing of a picture, of one of the neurons that goes to that somatosensory, the touch cortex that I showed you on that diagram, area 3B. It was done by Landry and Duchenne in ca Canada. And the, the most amazing thing about it is while the neuron starts off quite simple, it really covers about one millimeter square in its arborizations and is overlapped by the other neurons in a dense tangle that might remind you of a jungle. Okay, now I can have the lights, thank you. Well, what I've tried to indicate to you is the enormous complexity of the nervous system, and despite the commonality of its structure, an enormous amount of individual variance right down to the level of the so-called neurons themselves. Now I think we can take that slide off and turn to our next problem, which is to consider on this basis of information how could we put this all together? If we confront an environment with such a nervous system, what happens? Well, the conventional idea, uh, abstracted immensely here, is that somehow a stimulus, some particular occasion in the world, interacts through neurons with this network, and that that leads to a uh, change in the chemistry of the synapses between the nerves, changing the value of how much one signal will go versus another, and that eventually will account for learning and memory. This is no theory. This is a metaphor here. Now, um, nonetheless, the metaphor prevails, and the question before us is, how can we decompose it into possibly competing more specific models? Well, I'm going to take the liberty of saying that even at the level of neuroscience, not, as you will hear from Dr. Shank and Simon and Dennett, at the level of language, at the level of neuroscience, there is a tacit information processing model, namely that the stimulus of the external world represents some kind of information, that is to say, describable in some way, a little more abstract and universal than the prejudice of the observer, and that that goes into the brain, which has some kind of program, genetic, and acquired through that other learning program, which in turn leads to learning and memory. And the learning and memory leads to behavior. Of course, I've left out the feedback loop that would cover them. That is the kind of model, I think, that prevails today in neuroscience. And what I'd like to do in the next couple of minutes is point out to you that there is an alternative way of looking at the nervous system that confronts several problems that the information pro processing model has when it deals with a world that does not come neatly labeled and named. And that model, which we'll call the group selection model, meaning selection of groups of neurons of the kind that I talked about that are highly variant and enormous in number in large repertoires, that the stimulus comes in, and indeed, as you'll hear later, it's not neatly tagged. The brain 
confronts that in various filtered forms, and a selection is made from a vast repertoire of variant neurons in each individual, leading to amplification of the synapses of the adapted groups in an analogy with differential reproduction in evolution. That is indeed, instead of dividing, as individuals do in evolution, to form progeny, these cells will selectively strengthen certain synapses and weaken others in such a way as to lead to a change in the population balance of these repertoires. And the assertion is that this is capable of the process of generalization, namely, the ability upon confrontation with a small number of members of a rather large set being able to confront and identify new members. That puts before us a very fundamental question which I'm sure Dr. Dennett knows much more about than I do, both historically and in fact, and that is, what is the nature of the stimulus? Is it an essential class? That is, does the world come packaged, as some of the essentialists felt the jungle was for tigers, in labels? Is it a list in which singly necessary and jointly sufficient features will define an object? A chair, a table, a leaf, a particular niche, a vein on the leaf, what have you. Or is it, in fact, an arbitrary class, something which the animal simply names for convenience with no necessary relationship to other members? I think Dr. Dennett will recognize the ancient doctrines of realism and nominalism hiding in there somewhere, but don't ask me. Or is, in fact, the signal, as Ryle, the philosopher, has named it on the basis of Wittgenstein, a polymorphous set? Let me, or polymorphous class, let me say what I mean by that. This is a little uh, quiz that was given to smart Cambridge students in England. It took them about six hours to find out the difference between yes here and no there, and they did it by most devious means, as students will occasionally do, and most of them didn't get it. I want to show you that pigeons get it very nicely. This is a so-called polymorphous set. It's a disjunctive class, and the feature that distinguishes, or the discriminant that distinguishes yes here from no is the following. At least two of round, or dark, or symmetric. Every object in this class fits that and not that. These are singularly difficult classes to resolve. But they appear by, by studies in modern categorization theory in both psychology, perceptual and conceptual psychology, and in fact, in thinking about the problem, to be closer to the description of real stimuli in the world. And if the world of stimuli is a world of polymorphous sets, how can an animal adaptively categorize and generalize? Now I've focused our problem. And if I could have the next slide, uh, I will try to show you an instance by Professor Herrenstein and Professor Sorella at Harvard of a most startling uh, finding related to this world of stimuli. Dr. Sorella presented pigeons under an operant conditioning mode in which they were rewarded for a particular kind of behavior that arose when they were presented with images of oak leaves, as you see on the top, in four presentations upon reward those pigeons positively discriminated all oak leaves from all other kinds of leaves shown on the bottom, and the class is fairly large. Well, you might say pigeons live in the world of oak leaves. Evolution could easily have selected their brains for that, although these days, you know, one wonders where pigeons live. The so these clever researchers then exposed the pigeons to pictures taken by a scuba diver of fish. Now, I think most of you will agree that pigeons do not generally evolve in a world of fish. And the astonishing thing is, upon operant reward, the pigeons, upon a few examples, recognized with a high degree of accuracy all subsequent pictures of fish in a highly complex mode. On the next slide, you'll see one, one of Dr. Herrenstein's paradigms. Maybe you can lower that a bit. The key examples are upstairs. Trees. Pictures of trees and Kodachromes, chosen at random from a large set, recognized upon three or four examples, and then every example of trees. Trees near, trees far, trees against water, trees against buildings, but not things that might look like trees, like this vein pattern, this celery stalk, this Central Park lantern, and what have you. Indeed, um, we can take the slide off. Indeed, what is startling about this set of findings is the robustness of the pigeon behavior. We can take that one off, okay? Uh, the robustness of 
showing slides. <laughs> Indeed, Dr. Herrenstein has told me that he took a picture of a lady in Cambridge, and it sounds more, more like a French art movie when you tell it this way, in various contexts, and then showed pictures of this lady in forests at 800 feet, in various busy thoroughfares, and the pigeon had no problem whatsoever recognizing her. If he dressed her friend up down the block in the same clothes and the same scenes, the pigeon rejected her. Now, you must not rush to the idea that this pigeon is, in fact, generalizing upon language or a descriptor of human beings, or as my colleagues might say, parsing for that. Nonetheless, the pigeon is generalizing in an astonishing way, and I assert that it is not very likely that by any means of conventional learning you could account alone for this particular behavior. Now let's come back to our theory. The theory of group selection pretends or hopes to account for this by saying that in fact during animal development enormous repertoires of variant networks of neurons are formed in every single individual brain. And then experience, which must be considered to start, in fact, then in utero for us vertebrates and mammals, experience leads to a selection of those groups that are adaptive. And this has a resemblance to some of the ideas of Dr. Shank at a much higher and more abstract level. More than one kind of neuronal group, ipso facto, just like the immune system, will be successful for any particular output of performance. And one kind can be used for more than one signal for two or more different signals. Well, if I present a theory of this kind sufficiently bodilarized for this occasion, I should at least present some evidence. And indeed, now evidence has accumulated. The first kind of evidence I'd like to show you, now I'd like that next slide, please, comes from our laboratory. We've been interested in the problem of variance in the developing nervous system in the following way. What we want to know is, um, how the nervous system makes its connections in the first place. And in order to do that, we've isolated molecules that are responsible for the interaction of one growing nerve with another during the early parts of formation of the network. These molecules are known as CAMs, or cell adhesion molecules. And the one you're looking at in a cartoon form up here is known as NCAM, the neural cell adhesion molecule. It is found on the surface of every neuron in the body, central and peripheral. And it is a very curious molecule indeed. It comes in three regions, as you see, colored differently, each one of which is quite separate in three-dimensional space. The red region out here is responsible for binding to another molecule that's sticking out from another cell. Here's the cell. You must imagine it to be as big as this building. And then put about um, half a million of these molecules sticking out of its surface like that, waiting to stick to another molecule. The middle part of this molecule has an unusual chuck structure which is charged. We won't go into that. On the next slide, you will see the mode by which these molecules bind. Here's a cell over here sticking a molecule out, another cell sticking out an identical molecule. They bind to each other. That's been shown mechanistically. The astonishing thing about these molecules is they switch on and off during development in an extraordinary way to define the ultimate address of particular neural circuits. There are now three such molecules, and now, as of yesterday, the gene for one of them has been isolated. And the picture is one of an enormous dynamism of shutting the molecules on and off, depending on the milieu, constructing circuits. And indeed, if you perturb the molecules that define the address not by having a particular place pre-assigned, but by the dynamics of the situation, you get a scrambled nervous system. That's been done inside the animal, but on the next slide, maybe I can show it to you outside the animal. Concentrate on this middle frame on your left and compare it to the one on the right. The one on the left shows those round globs up there. Those are actual nerve cell bodies seen in an electron microscope, projecting their nerves in an orderly pattern of coronal radiation of branches. When we block the cell adhesion molecule, which is responsible for that structure, we get the spaghetti-like structure you see up at the top of the right middle panel. Each individual nerve fiber just goes off at random and makes a mess. So here we have a principle not only of common structure and regulation, but also of implicit and obligate variation in the formation of every nervous system. The consequence, to make a long story short, is that no two nervous systems, even those of twins, can be alike. Well, 
Um, this is one kind of evidence required by this theory. You will remember, could you take that slide off a minute? You remember that if that's the case, I have to show how variant networks are formed. And these molecules are not the only way, but they're an obligate path. The next thing I have to do is show you how experience could select groups. And here we have, thanks to the work of uh, Professor Mertzenich and his colleagues in, in California, University of California, I'll have the next slide now, um, an absolutely extraordinary example in the so-called somatosensory cortex. You see that our old friend up there of the map. Now his experiment is rather simple. I wonder if this is going to look absurd. He sticks an electrode into the monkey's skull. And he puts it in that area, 3B. He then touches the finger, and of course, in a controlled and meticulous and, in fact, immaculate fashion that scientists would otherwise, if, if you did otherwise, they'd consider irresponsible. Um, and he makes a map. He presses the finger, and he sees which cell fires. And that's the criterion for his map. Now, here is what he finds. No two monkeys have the same map, although all maps represent the digits as you can see here. They represent the digits. Here's that map blown up in a particular fashion. Well, they're named over here. Digit one, two, three, four, five up in the right panel, and then the Palmer areas, etc. and you see the hand over there. But no two, no two animals alike. Then he does an astonishing experiment. He cuts one of the three nerves to the hand, the so-called median nerve, this one over here, which supplies the so-called glabrous or smooth skin of these fingers from the thumb to the middle of the middle finger over here. And he ties it so it can't uh, grow back. And then he records immediately and for six months thereafter. And he sees the most astonishing thing, and I welcome Dr. Milner's comments on that for the speech area. What he sees is a kind of Darwinian competition. The map immediately changes when the access to the world changes. The dark areas representing the back of the hand begin to take over, as you can see in the bottom map. And even more astonishingly, the map areas assigned to those nerves that have not been cut are immediately changed in their borders. And then for six months after, a kind of Darwinian struggle occurs where the remaining nerves, without any evidence whatsoever of growth, take over the remaining area after a little bit of a fight landing up with a map that's different in each case. Well, I won't go into all of the details of Dr. Mertzenich's experiment, but it is an experiment which exactly fulfills the idea that the substrate of the map are groups of these neurons tied together. The inputs select certain of them, and after competition and struggle, some of them come up as a map. And if you change the conditions, a new map comes up. Well, I can have that off now, and I can turn, finally, to a consideration of how this theory might be put together in a consistent fashion. What I've explained to you is certain evidence which is consistent with parts of it, but the question is, could you build a machine which would do such a thing, an unprogrammed automaton, constructed according to such principles? Again, time and space do not permit me to go into all of the details, but what I would like to do is briefly describe a machine of this kind that my colleague George Ricci and I, uh, and now others, have been constructing, uh, simulating it, of course, in a computer. The first thing you will notice if you put together what I said is that it won't do to try to categorize an unlabeled world by just your finger or your eye. You need finger and eye and motion and a whole lot of other kinds of samples that are independent for this set of polymorphous classes. And one possible way in which you might think of this is, for example, if you saw the pattern A, not the letter, that your eye, in fact, would be able to register certain local characteristics like the bar and what have you, or the ending, whereas your hand might be able to trace the continuity of the figure. And in your brain, thanks to evolution, these maps and a number of other things, um, a correlation is made between the registrations in one area of the cortex and in the other. You need both local features and you need to, if you will, define the object. It is an interesting thing that besides pigeons, three-year-old human babies are marvelous experimental objects for this. Professor Elizabeth Spelke, for example, in the University of Pennsylvania, has rather convincing studies to indicate that a three-month-old infant defines an object not by its texture, color, size, adjacency to other objects, but by its systematic relative movement with respect to an occluding object. And it does, of course, not have to be the object as a scientist describes it. Well, how could that happen? The idea is that whatever the pattern is, 
some local features are abstracted, some correlation defining the object is then put in, selection occurs upon groups which are mapped to each other, and their correlation now stands for aspects of a class. We happen to call that a classification couple. It doesn't really matter. But in this machine, could I have the next slide, which I shall not describe in detail, um, you can see an example of the layout, and then I'm almost finished. This machine is called Darwin II. Its left side is called Darwin. Its right side is called Wallace. The idea is that right or wrong, we have to be reverential. <laughs> um, and the purpose of Darwin, you will see on the next slide, but for a moment, let's keep this. Go back. Sorry about that. You see, if you say certain syntactical things, or could you go back one? Yes. The purpose of Darwin is to look at individual features of something presented to this visual monster, which has no program but only boundary conditions. And then selections are made on its, quote, neuronal groups in such a way as to yield patterns. Quite independently, it does a kind of search of space and traces outlines of things in varying orders that aren't important and makes another pattern. And then the two things are linked together. Can I have the next slide? In this automaton, which has at least a million connections in a computer representation, Darwin's choice is to make an individual unique response to each object in a particular position in space, but after strengthening its synapses, as you will, to respond stronger to that particular object, even though it hasn't identified it. Wallace, on the other hand, gives a similar response to different stimuli that have common class characteristics, like all the forms of A or what have you. And finally, because of the way the structures higher up are linked, the interaction of these representations gives a kind of associative recall. Can I have the next slide? This next slide shows a look into Darwin and Wallace's brain. Um, if we look on the uh, left side here, we're looking at Darwin. If we look at the lower order networks, we're looking at, this is for our convenience, its response to a narrow letter A, a broad letter A, and a letter X. But higher up, that response has no figural identity with anything we show it. And at the same time, the Wallace side has identical responses to the two different letters A. Now, we've tested this automaton. It doesn't do magnificently well, but 80% of the time with a great variety of different objects and without any instruction from the outside. It's a solipsistic machine. It does rather well. Well, that, we feel, is not an adequate, but a, an initial confrontation with the problem of the self-consistency of any selective theory of brain function. Of course, the thing that would excite scientists the most is um, finding out uh, additional facts of the kind uh, that I mentioned. Well, I am almost done. Now I should only like to make a remark or two about the consequences of such models should they prove to be correct. Before I do that, I think it may be useful to read to you from a work of a Harvard physicist named Percy Bridgman. I don't know if he's fallen in disfavor. But he is an exponent of a theory called operationalism. He's not the originator. And he says, it seems that we are coming to an awareness of the existence and importance of our mental tools from the side of the sciences rather than from the side of the humanities. The reason is not any reflection on the humanities, but is a consequence of human frailty and the fact that the humanities are so much more complex and difficult than the sciences. The most important intellectual task for the future is to acquire an understanding of the tools and so to modify our outlook and ideals is to take account of their limitations. This task is not to be accomplished by any return to the insights of the past. The insight that there is any problem here at all is devastatingly new in human history. The sciences and the humanities find themselves facing the problem together. It is too difficult and too pressing to permit the luxury of division of forces. Appreciation of the existence and nature of the problem is the first step toward the invention of new methods and outlooks that will be necessary to solve it. It seems to me that the human race stands on the brink of a major breakthrough. We have advanced to the point where we can put our hand on the hem of the curtain that separates us from an understanding of the nature of our minds. Is it conceivable that we will withdraw our hand and turn back through discouragement 
and lack of vision? Well, with that, let me summarize, ladies and gentlemen. In this lecture, what I wanted to do is give you a feeling for some new thinking that is occurring in brain science. You will, of course, hear more sophisticated ideas about much more sophisticated problems uh, later on, but I hope uh, you will share my faith that this is a reasonable basis for those subsequent remarks. I have assumed that only one direction is correct, population thinking, but by no means is that a proven fact. It is, in fact, however, gaining increasing support, and it has rich implications for human values. And I'd like to say something about that with all the risks entailed by extrapolation. Individuality, as in all population thinking, is its central feature. Categorization is the fundamental act, not conventional learning, and it must be adaptive. The fundamental act in memory in such a system is recategorization, not exact recall. Chronology is important, and repertoire is important. As I will show, as I have said, categorization is fundamental and adaptive. Memory is recategorization. As I will show, that will lead to the conclusion, I believe, that all perception is in fact an act of creation, not at all prefigured solidly, however boring habit is, and that all memory is an imaginative act. The consequence, I think, is clear, but it's debatable. No idea is a priori authentic by any method and that includes scientific ideas and scientific theories. For the theologians amongst us, I think one consequence, again debatable, is that free will and free agency exist but are limited. Both chronology and repertoire are important. We are indissolubly linked to the world by both natural selection and this kind of somatic process, if it be real, of group selection. Now you can make one statement too many. May I have the lights? And I think I have done so. And I will finish, since this has a certain theological base, by telling you a story of a medieval traveler. Could we have the lights, please? Who was an illuminator of manuscripts and passed from monastery to monastery, just as I have gone from the Rockefeller to Gustavus. And uh, when he finished, the monks thanked him. Could I have those? Thanks. Um, and said, why walk? Why don't you take our horse? He said, well, how will I return it? The other monastery is 100 kilometers away. They said, it's all right, we have a Hertz system. And uh, when he got on the horse, they said, but there's just one thing we forgot to tell you. This horse is a religious horse. It doesn't obey ordinary commands. If you want it to walk, you say, thank God. If you want it to canter, you say, thank God, thank God. If, could I have the lights full? If you want it to gallop, you say, thank God, thank God, thank God. And he said, well, what do you say if you want this horse to stop? And he said, you say, amen. Well, he got on the horse and he said, thank God, and he walked through the forest. He saw a clearing and said, thank God, thank God, and it began to canter. And he built up his enthusiasm and he said, finally, I see a clearing. Thank God, thank God, thank God. And the horse took off. The hair blew through his, his skull. He was extraordinarily excited. He said, this is the way to go. This is the only way an illuminator of manuscripts should travel. Went to his horror. Within about 100 yards, he saw an enormous crevasse of a thousand feet. And he said, what was that word they told me? What was that word? And finally he said, amen. And he got right within one inch of the thing when the horse stopped. He looked up and he said, thank God. <laughs> Since we're running a little bit late, I think we'll adjourn at this time and reconvene at 2 o'clock this afternoon.